So now I want to show you how to look from beginning to end at the different components to see the different statistics and performance counters for each element of the iSCSI network. And this will help you to understand these numbers now where we've got full control over the system. In the future where you've got multiple switches with multiple uh, ESXi hosts, it can be a little bit more difficult to understand for the first time what the numbers mean. Okay, let's start off by looking at a guest operating system. Um, we've got a guest operating system here running uh, at 2700 IOPS. Uh, 197, very high latency. The workload we're representing here may not be real life, but it's just so we can understand what these numbers mean. So we know that we've got high IOPS, we know that we've got high transfer rate, we also know we've got very high latency. We're now going to set a separate guest operating system running. Okay, this is again going to have some high IOPS, slightly less transfer rate, and a slightly better latency. So we've got two independent guest operating systems putting a load through one ESXi host. Now, at the moment, it's really easy within the guest operating system to see what the IOPS is pulling and to see what the transfer rate is because we've got IO meter running. So what we want to do is have a look and see how these numbers are reflected in the different performance stats. So the first thing to look at is the network cards on the ESXi. Now if we look for our NICs 6 and 7, which are the two NICs that are uh, running all our iSCSI traffic, we can see that they are both running at approximately 100, 100 megabytes per second. So that would imply that our total load from all our guests is 200 megabytes per second. We've got 176 coming through here and 23 coming through here. So we can understand that the combined of both guests are represented through the network card. Now that network card will tell us what the transfer rate is in total. Now, so if we're looking at a bottleneck and we see that all the V kernel NICs are operating at a maximum, then we know that's potentially where the bottleneck is and whether we need to add additional paths for our iSCSI traffic. Now the next place to look at statistics is on the ESXi kernel. Now we do this by putting in. Now the command to see any real time performance stats within the ESXi host is ESX top. Okay, here, here we can see a lot of statistics around uh, the performance CPU used, uh, memory, for the different VMs and CPUs. That's not what we're interested at the moment. What we're interested in is looking at the storage. So the first stage to look at is at the HBA. So we push D, and this shows us each of the HBAs on the ESXi host. Now we know the software iSCSI adapter is number 38. As we can see here, we've got a number of uh, columns. The first column is the number of commands per second, i.e. IOPS. And that makes sense, that's 8,200. And just to recap, we know that's about right because we've got 2,600 here and 5,700 here, which pretty much matches up. Then we've got the number of megabytes per second that are being brought across, 190 again. Just to double check, we have got 170. And 23, these match up. So what we are seeing here, effectively, is the accomplishment of all the VMs on this host, what their total amount of throughput IOPS is being utilised on the iSCSI adapter and effectively being handed off to the NetApp. And it's here that we can look at, if we see that we've got 190 meg throughput, and we know that we've only got two one gigabit paths, we start to think, well, we're getting very close to the maximum of saturating that connection, and, and in fact, is that bottleneck. What we've got here is the latency. So this is the overall latency for the whole HBA adapter. Here we've got the latency between the um, HBA adapter and the guest operating system. 
Uh, because we're not saturating the performance of the iSCSI adapter, that's why that's showing zero. So indeed, this last column shows us the perceived latency by the guest's operating system. And as we can see, this is about 10 milliseconds, which are kind of about acceptable, right on the borderline. The next stage is to then look at the individual data stores. We do that by pushing U. Now we have the same kind of stats um, here, including the queue length. We have the individual IOPS for each data store. Now each of my um, guest VMs are doing the test against two different data stores, which are, represent two different lungs on the NetApp. And that's why we can actually see almost exactly the same number of IOPS that's showing in the guest against each individual uh, data store here. We can also see that the megabytes per second pretty much match what we're seeing in IO meter. But the interesting fact here is the latency. Now the HBA showed an average latency of 10 milliseconds, which is just borderline acceptable. What we're actually seeing here is that we've got five milliseconds on one data store and 22 milliseconds on another data store. Well, clearly 22 milliseconds is not particularly good. And this is something we would need to investigate. So just because the total average is 10 and is acceptable, doesn't mean that we don't actually have a storage problem further down. And this is a really good way to, to investigate. Now, just to make things easier, you'll notice that the data stores give some unfriendly names. This matches the name here under, when we go into the data stores and the data store there, you'll see a device and you will see the uh, full path name here, which if we see the last three numbers, 31 and 35, represent here 31, 35. So we can, we can see here. Uh, here we have uh, the queue length. Now the queue length is the number of packets that are queued up on the uh, iSCSI kernel before they're sent off to the switch, which then gets queued up onto the SAM. Now each individual SAM provider has their own recommendations for the queue length. NetApps is 64, so we will see that this number will not exceed 64. If it does saturate at 64, it means that maybe we've got a performance uh, issue on that lung or data store and we should investigate whether we're uh, overloading that data store and whether we should be moving some of the uh, virtual hard disks onto a different data store. Finally we come down to monitoring the individual guest operating systems and we do this by pushing V. This gives us each individual guest server and we can now break these right down into seeing the number of IOPS per server and again, these represent exactly what IO meter is showing. Um, we can see the reads and writes in megabytes per second. And we can now see the latency on each individual VMs. Now, at the moment, I've only got one VM to the data store. So it's obvious that the latency at the data store is the same latency at the guest because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Obviously, in full production, that's not the case. You have multiple guests against lungs. And... So when we identify the lung that has got high latency, we can now drill down into that individual guest and see why there's such, or we can see where the latency lies. And then we need to start looking at that and saying, is that a problem? I mean, if that is a SQL server, then yes, we've got major problems. We can't have latency of that level. If this is a server that's been used for backing up or for streaming videos or for copying large files, uh, possibly then that is acceptable. Again, what we should be then looking at is dividing the number of IOPS by the megabytes per second, and this will give us uh, our block average block size. Um, assuming the server is performing one kind of task and not multiple tasks, i.e. SQL, Exchange, uh, DC, all on the same server, we can see that, guess the block size should be pretty uh, uniform for that server. And it will make sense then that if the block size is large, that's why we've got high latency, and that's because of the kind of job it's doing. So there's no right and wrong answer for everything. We need to use our knowledge of what the server is doing, along with the statistics we're seeing, to actually decide whether it's really a problem or not. Right, so moving on to the NetApp. Okay. The first and most common used command will be sys 
stat. That's you. So what this is giving us for the filer as a whole is the amount of CPU, the total number of IOPS, the network and disk kilobits in and out, the percentage of cache hit, and the utilization of the disk. Now the percentage of the cache, cache hit is when you request a file, it comes from the disk, gets written into the cache and then served up to the uh, to the guest operating system. If someone requests one of those files again and within a few seconds, then instead of taking from the disk, it'll take it from the cache. Part of the algorithms these uh, SANS use, as explained before, uh, is to predict uh, what files you're going to want. So when you start reading a file, if it has the ability, it will read ahead and copy that into the cache so that it can be served far faster. So whenever we're looking at these stats, we're looking for a high cache hit. Now, as I said, the um, IO meter test we're doing is 100% read sequential, and I've kept the files less than 20 gig. 20 gig is the amount of cache or, or RAM that the NetApp has. So in this instance, because it's just reading the same files again and again, it's reading it from cache. And this is what's been able to help us run these tests without having to worry about disks. The other uh, common error is the disk utilization is not the average of all the disks, it's the percentage utilization of the highest disk that is being used at the moment. Obviously the CPU um, is the amount of memory that's available. It's always good to look at this because you've got to remember that the uh, NetApp is an active active system and therefore in the event of a failure of one of the controllers, the other controller takes it over. Now if we are using 80% of the CPU on each controller uh, and one has to take the other over, that's 160% uh, which obviously is not possible and therefore performance will be hit. So uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping it generally below 50%. Um, so this, as I said, gives us a good indication of what the IOPS are. We're also able to divide the number of uh, kilobits that are being written per second by the IOPS and get a rough idea of the block size that's been used as an average. Uh, may or may not be useful. What this doesn't give us is latency. So by pushing Control C and going back to Command Prompt, we can do uh, stats show iSCSI. So for this instance, or this controller, we can see for iSCSI, it is saying the average latency is 8.6 milliseconds. Under 10, looks good. However, we've got to be very careful because this is a very high level average as such. So we need to be looking at the smaller components because if one has, is 20 milliseconds and the other is 5 milliseconds, obviously the average is going to be brought down significantly, but that one with 20 milliseconds is going to suffer performance. So we can get a little bit more information um, by going to uh, stats show lung. So if we look here, this is one of our test lungs, we can see actually the read latency here is 20 milliseconds, which is pretty high. Um, and we should really be investigating that. We can obviously see the IOPS are mm, uh, okay, uh, but there's a huge amount of reading in bytes per second. So that would imply, we would look at that high latency, uh, low IOPS, but quite high data transfer. There's obviously large block sizes, I would be investigating to see whether we are copying large amounts of files uh, off and on from that server and then whether that can be changed to be done out of hours or, or trying to work it through. Or maybe this has been done on the same server that's trying to run a SQL server um, and therefore we should split these different tasks out. If we look at the other lung that we're currently using at the moment, we can see that the average latency here is only 4 milliseconds. Um, and this is because we're using smaller block sizes. Uh, we can see the IOPS are higher, as you'd expect, from smaller block sizes. Um, but of course, the transfer rate is significantly smaller. So you would suspect that this has been used more of a uh, exchange SQL type scenario. In addition, we can also see real-time statistics from the lung. Um, 
So we do a lung stats OI interval of every uh, five seconds. Okay. So we can see here, as we would expect, the uh, two lungs that we've been using, uh, the IOPS, uh, the latency, and the Q length. I'm James Sillett and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any comments or questions, you can contact me by any of the means shown below.